Hello and welcome to the Sovereign Collective Podcast, where we bring you real raw truth for your self-empowerment. I'm your host, Sasha Calavota, and I believe that you can stand on your own two feet, but that you don't have to do it alone. I love learning from people who continually strive to raise the bar, to go against mainstream thinking, and who dare to question the general consensus. People are risking ridiculed or even risk the loss of their professional status as they bravely question the common narratives and challenge the rest of us to expand our minds and to reconsider what we think we already know. Join me in learning how to take control of your health and your mind so that you can have the energy to think more clearly and the confidence to step up and take responsibility for all aspects of your life. We promise to never censor here because I believe you are strong enough to hear the real raw truth to make up your own mind. If you like what you find here at the Sovereign Collective Podcast, then please share with your friends and family. I so appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And now, on to the show. Hey guys, Sasha here for another interview for the Sovereign Collective Podcast. And I have a really exciting interview for you today because it's going to be touching a topic that I've been quite focused on since last fall when I decided to change the focus of where I was putting my attention because I realized something. I realized that if I'm the one who's going to be creating the results of my life, maybe co-creating with the field, then it doesn't matter what I'm listening to or watching if it's from a a fear-based perspective or a understanding the truth perspective, if I'm angry and I'm giving all that my energy, then I'm not going to really get the results in my life that I want. So what are we going to talk about? Today I have with me Michelle Dillard. Michelle Dillard is married to Mike Dillard. And Mike Dillard is somebody that my husband has been following for about, like I was just saying, about 20 years. And so through another person that my husband follows, because my husband is a a, a personal coach and and he does relationship coaching. And so Brick Castillo was quite an influence on him as well. And you've studied with Brooke Castillo, right? This is Michelle Dillard, Mm -hmm. by the way. And so through Brooke Castillo, we learned about you. And then Michelle Dillard, who's my guest today, married Mike Dillard. And I have a very good friend, Jade. Thanks, Jade. Shout out to Jade who connected us, who was coaching with Michelle and Mike uh, right now. So it's funny, all these little things come together and here we are together today. And who is Michelle? Michelle is, she's a certified life coach. She's an NLP practitioner and she's also a hypnotist. And she's super passionate about the power of our minds, which I'm super passionate about right now, because being in the field of health and talking with people in the world of health and their health, if you don't, if you don't believe in the beginning and you just fall prey to the fear tactics or the fear mongering or just the lack of knowledge from the regular medical community and you fall into that and don't understand the power that you have within you, then you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. So the power of the mind, our perception, these are things that we're going to go into today. And so as Michelle says, most people walking around today believe their thoughts as if they are true and just how things are. But what happens if we move from being the thoughts to becoming the thinker of the thoughts? From this place, we can actually observe our thinking. And this is the most powerful tool we have to shape and create our reality. So Michelle will break down exactly what happens when we think a disempowering thought versus an empowering one. And the listeners will walk away, you listeners, you guys, will walk away with a new sense of power and freedom to create the lives that you want. And I think in a world where so much... Uh, fear mongering is creating people's actions and how they're responding. And I'd love to talk about that too, is what, what is, what is happening in one's body and mind and, and reality when they're coming from a place of fear, right? Cause this is where so many people are making their decisions from right now. And they have been for quite a few years now. And so I think this is a super timely talk and it's, it's always relevant, but now when it's really time to own our lives and take it all back, I think this is, before anything, this is where we got to start. So thank you, Michelle, so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's such an honor being here. I absolutely love your podcast. So it's a real pleasure for me and I'm I'm so excited to share and to dive in and, and talk about the power of the mind and how we really do create our own realities by the way that we think and feel and feel. And that's a big one. Yeah. And as I was saying, like in last about November, I thought, okay, shut it all off. I stopped. I didn't listen to any alternative, anything. And I started listening to certain people and I woke up with meditation. I went to bed with the meditation. Not that I want to do this every single day of my life, but I, I, I do. And I was listening to interviews all day long because it put me into a state. 
And mm-hmm. that's the state that I wanted to, to get into. So what I really want to talk about is the mechanics of this and how this is. And I tell you, our lives changed quickly. Like things started to change and it starts to change quickly, but it's so easy to get derailed today. If you're, if you're, if you're flipping on the news, I mean, you yeah. just, and, and they know that, right. Mm-hmm. They, they know that. So before we get into. 100%, I call it amygdala hijacking. <laughs> Right, right. And it's right. And it's an absolute tool that's being used, mm-hmm. right? And people's like, well, you know, I just want to know the weather. It's like, you don't need to listen to the news to do that. Why Why would you do that to yourself? Why? Right. Volunteer. There are other ways. Right. So before mm-hmm. we get into your amazing work, let's talk about, so did you, did you, do you have a hero's journey? Do you have, did you like, is your life very different than what it used to be? Did things come easy to you before? Like, how did you get to this? And why are you so excited to talk about this? topic. Yeah. Well, it is based off of my journey. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I was born into poverty. Uh, my mother, my father had passed away when I was a young girl and I grew up in an environment that was very much struggling. Like that was my reality. And that's really what shaped my worldview was that things are hard and that if you want to buy something, you need to hunt and scavenge and find it at a garage sale and and things, you know, in my childhood involved the church donating food to us wow. and going to clothing shelters. And so I really became so passionate about two things. One, the power of the meaning that you assign to your history and two, the power of our minds to create our reality. Right. I think of one as in looking back in the past and that's that our past shapes us and molds us, but we still have choice. We actually still have choice. Yeah. We live those things no matter what, that, that is the reality, but we still have the freedom to assign a different meaning to our past. And so I have sisters and I was the only one that got out of our life circumstances Mm -hmm. and, you know, poverty And I realized that we lived the same childhood, but I assigned a different meaning to it. You know, they've, my older sister has had a lot of like, you know, fibromyalgia and bipolar disorder and a lot of ailments. And I created a different survival adaptation because that, that truly was her survival adaptation in order to get love and attention. Mm -hmm. She created a lot of ailments and that's what gave her attention and love and I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. It's just, it's a survival adaptation that worked for her. Now, my survival adaptation was to become extremely resourceful and really good at things. And so that worked really, really well um, and helped me get out of where we were. But it also, I learned that I still had this identity on a deep subconscious level of someone who was in poverty even though I had, you know, real estate investments. And this was, we're talking about like 30 years ago. We're talking about like um, when I was 30 years old, like six years ago, I really, really, really started diving into changing my own identity um, because I still had threads of that identity of being a broke single mom. That's what I told myself when I was single was like, oh, I'm, I'm just a broke single mom. And I believed this story that life was hard and that thing that I had to struggle through things. And it wasn't until I had a conversation with my money coach at the time where she looked at my portfolio and she goes, Michelle, you're not struggling. You're a real estate investor. And that changed everything for me in an instant. And I started seeing myself as a real estate investor. Now, within one year, probably, nah, yep. Within one year of that shift, that identity shift, how I saw myself, how I thought about myself, I went from having a home paid off that was about $300,000 to making over, to becoming a self-made millionaire. And I came from in a year. Okay. But that took me really questioning everything that I thought, everything that I thought about myself, everything that I thought about my past you know, looking at areas that I hadn't looked at before, really, really observing myself, like my own little science experiment and just getting really, really curious as to where these thoughts were coming from. Wow. And so did you, was that all self-motivated? 
when you started on that path? Like, did you, did you, did you seek coaching yet at that point or anything? Or was that, that within that year, that was just all you questioning everything? Well, that was, I did seek a money coach at the time. And that's when, it, that's when she said that one profound seed oh, oh, right. and that was worth everything yes. for me because okay. it, it gave me the ability to see myself in a different light. And it also shined a light on really subconsciously how I saw myself, my subconscious identity. And so that for me, just, you know, the floodgates bust open. And then I dove into, and I went to the life coach school, I took NLP trainings and I was like, this is everything. This is like, I felt like I got the keys to the kingdom. Like I figured it out. It's all within me. And so I started diving deep. So fun and so fun and so empowering, but I swear to God, I swear some people are afraid of that power. They don't want to it's like a responsibility that they, you know, it's that ignorance is bliss idea. It's like, oh, I don't know. And they want to be the victim. They they want somebody to do it for. They don't, they don't want to do it. And whether it be figuring out their relationship, like, so, and I feel it's almost relationships to everything, relationship to themselves, to mm-hmm. other people, to money, to their, to health, to their diet, to their ways. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if you get to own it, then you get to do something mm-hmm. about it. It's so exciting. A hundred percent. And, you know, you just said a really key word there was like victim of the circumstances or victim, right? Like that is the number one most disempowering way that we can ever think about ourselves. And, and it may feel so true. It may like, there may have been really terrible things that have happened in the past, mm-hmm. but when you really observe the thinking and when you really, really observe okay, how does it feel when I think that I, that bad things happen to me and that it didn't happen for me? Like, and then I, and what I would do in my mind is I would play out that the reaction, what would happen when I think that, what would I feel and how would I show up to circumstances? How do I show up in life? Who am I carrying that story of I'm the victim and these things happen to me, Right. right? Like there were a lot of things in my childhood that I could have carried that story easily. And I would be in a completely different place than I am today. But instead I've, I've had to go back and look at those things and really, really ask the hard questions, you know, to answer your question, why, why don't people go back and why do they carry the the victim story? And I think that there's this idea that it's gotta be hard too, that, that going back and like looking at those past memories, are going to like dig up all this pain and dig up all this trauma all over again. And the truth is, is that we can actually honor what we have survived in our past. Mm. If we choose to look at that, look at it that way, like, damn, I went through some stuff. Like I, and I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm still doing this. I'm still moving forward. And the challenge is, the real challenge is to see how everything did happen for you. So like my dad passing away at a young age happened for me because it taught me to be resilient. It taught me to overcome so much in my life that now it's just not a thing anymore. Right. And so the answer to your question of, you know, what prevents people, I think, I think there's a misbelief that, that it's going to be really, really painful to look back. And the truth is, is that it's painful not to, because when you don't, those stories still live in you and but and constantly forever it's like okay why didn't you just intensify it for just a short period of time and get through it rather than just live this discomfort your whole life a hundred percent even though we like relegate it to a dark corner of our mind and like try to lock the door and like lose the key it's still there and guess what it's actually living in your biology as well like our cells carry the memory of it and that's what i believe and if you've you know followed followed bruce lipton's work and dr joe dispenza that's what leads to dis-ease in the body is like this bottled up emotion this unprocessed emotion or things that we just need a perspective shift. We just need to look at it things a different way. And we can release all that negative emotion that we've been carrying around like a heavy backpack that we just don't need to anymore. But the, you know, the way to think about it is exactly what you just said. Like why it's going to be there no matter what you might as well just look at it and get rid of it and move through it instead of ignoring it. Right. And I think the problem maybe for some people comes down to 
the tool to truly release it, right? Because so many people, they go to, they go to the psychiatrist, they go to the psychologist, they go to talk therapy and they just reiterate the same thing. It's like, and okay, so we're here again, right? Like how many hundred percent. I think for some people, they probably have there, where's the tools, Right. And you don't know that there's an alternative way to do that. And that's who I started listening to last fall. It was like Joe Dispenza. It was like Joe Dispenza 24 hours a day, unless I was sleeping, swear to God. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay. I was like, right, remember that, right. And it's like, okay, I'm in an elevated emotion all day long. And it just <laughs> it changes things. It it really changes things. So for somebody listening to this and they're saying, okay, all right, I'm going to go there. I got to get those cobwebs up. I got to get those demons out. What, where do they start? Where do they start? That's a great question. You know, what I would suggest is really starting with understanding, you know, I I think there's certain frames that you need to adopt and understand before going in, right? Because just like we said, talk therapy and like spending all this time, there is such thing as re-traumatization. There is such thing as experiencing something and there's no closure. There's no loop, you know, there's, there's no shift. There's no release. Right. And what that is, is that just is intensifying the victim story even more. And so you've got to first adopt the frame that everything has happened for you. And that even if something awful happened in the past, there's somehow, there's some way that that can be used for good. Now I used to work with human trafficking victims and that is a, you know, telling someone that, Oh, everything's happening for you, you know, (laughs) It's, it's a frame that sometimes is hard to accept at first, but when you do shift and you go, wow, okay. My story, like with the people that I've worked with in the past, like their stories helped free so many other people that were trapped in that scenario. And it took their story. It took them sharing the pain and the things that they have overcome. It took them owning their story to help free all these other people. And so that became, you know, their trauma became the keys that unlocked other people from having to experience those things. So there's, there's always something here that we can use. And it's really up to us to find, to find the roses and the ashes, to find those little tiny, you know, nuggets of wisdom and to, to, to hold on to them because it's so easy to fall into that. It's just happening to me, not for me. So, so the first thing is to, to shift into that and to adopt that belief and to really go in knowing that there is some treasure. It's like treasure hunting through your past, right? Like what did that teach you? What, who, how much stronger did you become because of it? What can you do now that you couldn't had you not had that experience? And so that really is the shift is really neurologically reassociating the emotion that you have towards an event in the past. And the perspective shift allows that. And it's seeing how that actually helped you in some way. Like, how did that serve you? And just even asking that question, you know, you know, pull up, this happened in the past and then journal, how did that serve you? And really reflect on it. And even if there's some type of positive emotion, if, you know, really looking at say that, say that you, your experience can help someone else and then think and feel into how great it would be to help someone else. And what that does is that reassociates the emotion on a neurological level, and it helps you release the negative trapped emotion in the body. And so reassociating by going through that process is what helps release it and also opens up your future too, because there's less chances that you'll repeat that cycle because you don't resist it anymore. Right. And there's that, what you resist persists. Uh Mm -hmm. Right. And right. Yeah. So, okay. So let's relate this say to something like people like to talk about money. Yeah. Well, like to, you know, and I think it's important to really understand and own that these days with where, I don't know, who knows where this whole financial world is going and, Mm -hmm. you know, with, with electronic currencies, all this stuff and all this tracking and stuff and understanding how to get your needs met. However, is probably a really important thing. Let's talk financial needs and and things that are going to allow to, to allow you to be comfortable. And I don't mean comfortable. I don't mean convenience and everything's just a click of a button and you have a smart, every appliance in the house. I mean, 
you've got a house, you have, you know, you have, you have all the food and you think you, you, all your needs are met. So, and somebody's struggling to pay their bills. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how does one reframe that? Cause this is one thing where I'm just going to say what I did. Cause I just like, I just got, cause I think people want the feeling of what it's going to give them. Mm -hmm. Right. Do they really want the money or do they want the feeling that that is the, is going to give them. So I'll yes. let you, I'll you, let you take it over. I want, I want to hear from <laughs> you, but I have to tell you people, things change quickly when you change how you're, what you're focusing on and bring in some gratitude. Right. So what, what are people going to do? How, how do they yeah. do that when they're struggling and they got kids to feed and all that stuff? Right. Yeah. The, I mean, the stresses of life. Right. And I, and I know that very well, the, the struggling, the paycheck to paycheck, the figuring out like, oh my gosh, how am I going to make this work? And all that feeling of just like dread constantly. Like I remember in times in my life where I, I definitely felt that 24 seven. And, you know, what helped me really shift is just knowing that I am in control, that my life is 100% my responsibility. And I know it, it, it again ties back to, you know, believing that you are the creator of your reality and that everything is happening for you. And so when I started truly seeing and believing that, oh no, I am in control. Like even if, even if a, say a boss fired me or an employee quits or something like that, there's, there's always some good in it. It's like, what is this teaching me? How can, okay. It's teaching me to have an extreme dedication and focus to the thing that I need to learn in order to make the money, right? Like, I think that we can use that negative emotion and we can just give it a little nudge to a more resourceful emotion. Like we can take the energy and we can transmute it into channeling it into something that's going to move the needle for us. And so for me, like when I was a kid and I was really dealing with my, the, the grief of my father's death. I channeled that energy into dance and I became oh, wow. really, really good at dancing and yeah. taught myself. Like I had to find a little place to work from and I passed out flyers so I could get free dance lessons. But I, I looked at it as like, this is energy and I can use this energy. You know, anger is energy. It has momentum to it, right? Like you can muster up this energy and use it like a resource and go, okay, I feel this. Now, how do I want to use this? Am I going to use this and feel sorry for myself? Or am I going to use this and go, you know what? This is the last day. I am tired of living like this. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make a shift. I will, you know, stay up every, like whatever it takes is sometimes you've got to get that bottom of the barrel or like breakdown moment that then changes everything because that that is the massive amount of energy you need to shift everything in your life. So, you know, for those listening right now, and if you're in that position, you know, just know that this is a moment that you get to, you get to pivot everything. You get to create your own reality. You get to decide, you know what, I've had enough of living like this and I'm not going to go one more day or I'm going to find whatever it takes to, to, to make a difference, to be, to be more successful and look at all the things that you can grow into to make that happen. And you were saying something that uh, was really interesting in that interview I was listening to just a little while ago. You talked about the concept of desiring from having to desire yeah. from having. So mm -hmm. can you unpack that? Cause that's Absolutely. really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the desire from having the concept is, is that that which we do not want, and we have a negative emotion around, we're actually going to create more of why, because there's a negative emotion surround attached to it. And it doesn't really matter if we're having an emotion towards something. It doesn't matter if it's a positive emotion or negative emotion. It's just an emotion and it's energy. And that's going to amplify drawing it into your reality. And so whenever, wherever you can go to neutral, if there is something that you're like, say, say, um, I'm looking out at my car and I'm thinking, gosh, I really don't like my car. I want a new car. Well, what's the real energy that you're bringing to that is you're bringing, I don't like my car. Yeah. What's going to happen is you're going to create more. I don't like my car versus getting the new car. And so the desire from having is this concept of 
really looking at what you do have and almost tricking yourself into the things. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I mean by that. You know, you mentioned this earlier and and it's pretty profound. So I want to circle back to it and to really let it sink in, which is we actually don't want money. We actually want the things that we think that money is going to buy us. And beyond that, we don't even want the things that the money is going to buy us. Like it's not the car that you want. It's the feeling that you get when you buy the car, right? And if you play that thinking out, if you play that thinking out, you'll find that what you're really after is a feeling and the most important feelings are actually free. Mm. So when I think that out, when I play that tape out, I think of, I want to feel abundant. I want to feel connection. I want to have friends that I feel deep connection with. And for me, then I realize I already have that. And then it allows me to see the world of, I already have everything that I want. And you know what? Sure. It'd be great to have the Ferrari and sure. It'd be great to have the, this and that's, but I'm not desiring it from this scarce mindset. I'm desiring it from a place of, I already have all that I need. Like a sunset is the most abundant thing that I can witness and observe. And for me, when I think of the energy of abundance, I just go witness the sunset. And again, that's free. And so when I really followed the path of what I'm actually searching for, I realized I already have it. And then you could be so grateful right there. And then you're vibing at a totally different frequency. And then that stuff comes to you more easily anyways, right? A hundred percent. Yep. Uh huh. And then you don't have that, that, that icky, lackey wanting of it. You're in a totally different place. And then it just comes and it's just so much fun. And it's like, Ooh, what else is possible? It gets so exciting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what, and that's that's uh that's like my my husband's studied a lot of Lester Levinson's work and he talks about that wanting from having rather than that wanting like what feels better to have such and such or to you know to want it or to have it well as soon as you mm-hmm. say that out loud it feels better to have it. and if you can get into that feeling yeah and then it just it just just like, like right now I think for me it's super easy to really feel super grateful and abundant because I've got this great garden that's producing so much it's just there's the abundance we were in BC for most of July and I'm just getting mm-hmm. this amazing blueberries by the case and they're so delicious and there's just so much ever in the sun you know you feel like it could just live on the sun's <laughs> energy and it's just and yeah. it's such a it's such a great time to practice this if you're not already because mm-hmm. there's so much around us right there's so much just right. to go out and see the, the like I mean we're I'm in Calgary. Mm-hmm. Alberta, right? It's pretty gray and dark. I mean, we have a lot of sun here, but it's not green for very long, right? Mm-hmm. It's not green. It can be white, very white and and sunny, but and it's just that having the short time and just such a mm-hmm. oh, such a grateful place for me to be in. Yeah. Just in yeah. It. And what you can do too is like if there's something that you're wanting to manifest and you're recognizing that the thing that you're wanting is actually tied to the feeling of say abundance, you know, like, Oh, I want to a new successful, you know, launch or something like that. And you're like, why? Okay. Because I really want the feeling of abundance. Cool. Then you go put yourself in the things that make you feel abundant. You harness that feeling. You go buy some blueberries from the market and like really harness that energy of, of gratitude and abundance and gratefulness and like just excitement. And then you, then you start thinking about the launch. Then you start thinking about, you know what? And then then what you can do is you can kind of channel that energy towards the thing that hasn't been created yet, but you kind of trick yourself a little bit into it's already been created. And then think not about the creation of the thing that you're about to launch, but the successful completion of it. And so visualizing, Mm -hmm. you know, cheersing at the end of it and the, the feeling of a job well done as if it's just already been happened. Right, mm-hmm. right, 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 right. And, and then act as it is so, right? I think that's mm-hmm. an important one too, because we're, again, where everybody's worrying and coming from fear mm-hmm. like that. Right. Just, just if you know, like that's what I love learning about right now is if if this realm works on some basic mechanics, then just show me the mechanics. And if that's just the way, then let's just do it, right? Yeah, hundred, yes. And, and that's exactly what I learned is like, it's really about becoming the observer, and, and not the thinker, like we are the thinker of our thoughts. Sure. But guess what? We actually have choice. And a lot of people don't realize that because they just think that the way that they're thinking is just how things are. That's just 
reality. And it's actually not. It's just a perspective of the reality. And I like to think that there's many realities all happening all at once. It's just which one are you subscribed to, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we become the observer of our thoughts, it gives us choice. And then from that choice, we can actually observe another reality. And what, what it does is whenever we have a thought, it, it creates this electrical impulse in the brain. And it that electrical impulse is sent through the body. And then what happens is a feeling is created. Now, I like to think of the feelings as like the our feelings are like fuel in the tank. And neutral is no gas. Mm. Positive is gas. Negative is gas. It doesn't matter. It's going to get you somewhere. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, whatever the object of your attention is is where that gas is going to get you. Right. So if you're focusing on what you're fearing, you're going to see more of it. You're going to witness more of it. You're going to find more reasons because what happens is when we look at that, which we don't want, we find more evidence that that reality is true. But when we look at what we do want, we also find that that reality is also true. Right. Exactly. Whether you think you can or you can't, you're right, right? That's a hundred percent. Right. And then then there's a guy that Jason Brashears, I know if you've been have you ever heard of him. He's an interesting guy who's spent a lot of time in jail and thinks we're living in a simulation. And but he basically yeah. says is the universe doesn't want to make you, it won't make you a liar. Right. So if you think it's hard or you haven't done enough, then it's, you're <laughs> gonna have evidence that it's hard and you have more to do. A hundred percent. Yes, absolutely. We are like meaning making machines. And whatever meaning we're assigning to something, we're always right. We're right. always right. Yes. And we'll we'll either create the circumstances, like we will create the scenarios for us to be right, or we will mirror. So there's like different ways that this shows up, right? If we're thinking, you know what? I think my employee is mad at me. So then you think, or you feel what? I don't know, upset about it. So then you start being upset to the employee. Mm. So that's like a mirror. That's a mirror effect where you are projecting what they might be thinking. And then you actually start doing it yourself. And then of course the other person is upset because you're treating them that way. Right. So then you're right. (laughs) We're always right. (laughs) So funny. It's so funny. So let's talk about unlearning. Cause that Mm -hmm. I think is a really key thing before people can even be open. They don't, I don't think a lot of people realize that they have a lot of unlearning to do. There's a lot of programming that keep people stuck in their way that this is the way life goes. And this is what we do. And this is how we raise our kids and Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So what can you say about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it definitely, a lot of it happens in school and conditioning, societal conditioning, right? Like they call it um, programming, TV programming for a reason. (laughs) That's not a coincidence. It is programming, And it is programming your subconscious to want things, to think that there's, you know, the, the total FOMO that we live in, like, we're not pretty enough. We're not this enough. We're not, you know what I mean? Constant chasing of wanting to buy things. But so, so what TV has a profound effect on the way that we think our environment has a profound effect on the way that we think, um, in school has a profound effect on the way we think, you know, like we're taught to, not listen to our body. We're taught to sit into chairs, to hold our bladder, to not honor our body, to have to like wait until a certain, you know, so there's so much that goes on in school where kids are taught to really go anti their biology and to listen to an authority based off off of what the authority is saying and ignore how they feel. Right. And so that's, that's been really interesting for me to observe. Um, and, and that also creates this huge, you know, the, the feeling of, I've got to get an A, I've got to succeed, I've got to achieve. And that if I, you know, this like fear of making a mistake and that carries into entrepreneurship, right. And if you want success, you're going to have to embrace failure. You can't have one without the other, right? you know? And so I I like to think of the unlearning, the great unlearning as this deconditioning process. And, you know, we're just like kind of stripping away these false beliefs by asking, when did you decide that? 
And to me, I always envision like a person going through a car wash, like in this deconditioning machine (laughs) and everything that they think that they know is up for negotiation. You know, when did you decide that? And yeah, what happens is the subconscious mind often pops up a, a memory, often pops up something in the past, like, you know, usually around before the age of eight to 10 years old, because that's when we're really in that imprint period, when we're really susceptible and we're open, our subconscious mind is just taking in everything. Um, and there's usually something back then to be looked at like, oh, I decided I couldn't listen to my body when we were taking tests and I had to go pee and I had to ignore myself, right? I had to ignore my urges or, you know, oh, I learned that this was bad and never to do that again when I was four. It's just listening, really listening to what comes up because our subconscious mind will tell us if we're willing to listen. And so sitting in quiet, sitting in silence and journaling um, is really, really helpful whenever there's a belief system that comes up and, and you'll hear it in people's language a lot, like, oh, I can't do that. It's like, really? When did you decide that you can't do that? And if you really That's sit with question. that, well, yeah, when you, if you really it. sit with that, it'll come up. The memory will come up. And then from that place, the next step is you go, okay, well, what else do I want to believe instead? What else is also true, right? Because whatever we observe, we're going to find whatever we look for, we're going to find. What other reality is also true that's more empowering that you would want to choose instead? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Love that. Love that. And then that's going to take practice. It's probably going to be a little uncomfortable for people too, right? I think Mm -hmm. even though, like I did a lot, I created a whole program on conscious pregnancy and parenting years ago and actually interviewed Bruce Lipton back then for it years ago. Um. But the, the thing is, is people are born, Elena Tonini Vladimirova is a woman that I've interviewed a couple of times and on this mm-hmm. as well, but she talks about how we are born into our comfort zone. So if you're born into a very uncomfortable, dangerous world, that's kind of your comfort zone. People kind of self-sabotage to get mm-hmm. back down to that. So, but also people, it's like the devil they know is better than the devil they don't know. And they don't yeah. want to be there. So it's going to have to be. So let's talk about getting uncomfortable because it's the big thing. People are mm-hmm. so comfortable these days. Oh my gosh. Yes. Day, right? And they just don't yeah. want to stretch. Yeah. A hundred percent. There, There's also like, if you think about human history, like how long we've been on this planet, how long have we really been in this type of comfortable scenario? And, and not very long, right? It's like a blip on the radar of, of human evolution. So our biology is hardwired for some level of threat for some level of something, right? So let's honor the history of our body and, and, and that, and then let's also take into effect that we are as a society, more depressed, more anxious than ever. Right. Mm -hmm. I figure there's a connection there. Like I figure that we're so comfortable, we don't know what to do with it. And it freaks us the F out, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's my theory mm-hmm. is that we've gotten so comfortable that it's uncomfortable. Right. And so what's the counter to that, right? Like, how do you, how do you course correct that? And that is actually designing challenge on purpose, designing challenge. That's like a healthy challenge, a healthy stress in which, you know, like some people do cold plunges and that's, that's a healthy stress. Um, or pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone for the purpose of growing, you know, because you're going to be uncomfortable anyways, you're going to either be uncomfortable staying the same, or you're going to be uncomfortable growing. So that is a choice that you get to make. Um, so that, that's just a little bit about like comfort and really how I believe we actually need to design some challenges to allow us to gain perspective and clarity on what really, you know, what isn't a threat? Because when we move into things that are actually challenging, it makes the other things that used to seem challenging, not as bad anymore. Suddenly you've got that, that scale has been widened. Right. And then there's the other there. And then there's the other of like, we get familiar with a certain amount of stress and chaos in our life, especially if we came from it, like I had, um, and then we will actually kind of question or, uh, reject a reality of safety because we don't understand it. We don't know it. 
It's not who we've identified, or maybe there's a worthiness factor, right? Like I remember when Mike and I got together, um, I actually tried to break up with him and he wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hilarious. Uh, yeah. He called me on it. You know, he totally called me on it. He's like, you know, I feel like you're pushing me away. And I was like, yeah, totally. <laughs> and when we, we really talked about it and when I really sat with it, I was like, I'm pushing you away because I think that you're actually the one and it scared the crap out of me. I didn't know how to handle that. And so that's like the body gets uncomfortable. The body has its own intelligence. And I actually, I noticed it then when I realized how physically uncomfortable I was in safety and love and receiving that type of abundance, which I had never received before. Um, and then I also noticed it when I was in interior design and I grew up, you know, again, grew up from poverty and here I am handling these like luxury high-end clients. And I would feel so uncomfortable in these like multi-million dollar mansions. And like, I just felt like totally a fish out of water. And so then I started realizing, oh, this is like, this is like nervous system training. My yes, nervous talk system. Talk about that. Like, cause I, you, I will good. Cause you, you talked about, you could people not being able to hold on to money because of nervous system. Right. So, okay. Totally. Good, good. Yeah. 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 So my nervous system was like attuned to, if you think of like a thermostat, my nervous system was attuned to a really comfortable broke level. <laughs> right. 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 And anything beyond that was like out of my, my range. I didn't feel comfortable. So then I started challenging myself. And I realized, okay, my body is like physically uncomfortable. When Mike and I first started dating, I, I had a skin thing that would actually flare up. No way. Um, yeah, I had a skin condition that would that was starting to flare up. And I, it wasn't until I had a, um, a, a therapeutic psychedelic session where I really learned that that was my body's way of like doing this camouflage thing and like push people away to try to make me not attractive so that I could be safe. Right. So the body will always, always, always work for your survival. The body will always tell you, Hey, this is not a good neighborhood or Hey, this isn't where you're like, it's always working for you. It's always trying to keep you safe. We just need to rewire the body into what safety is. And some people can go too fast, too far. And they can actually blow out their nervous systems. And so this is something that I really suggest that you move into slowly, that you give yourself the acceptance of where you're at and the realization that this is your body working for you. If you feel uncomfortable in certain scenarios, like, like when I started speaking on stages, I wouldn't feel comfortable on big ones. Like I had to work up to that and I'm still working up to that. You know, yeah. but my nervous system would probably be overwhelmed and I probably would have shut down if I did too much too soon. And so know that first you've got to become aware. So it all starts with awareness, being aware of your feelings and how do you feel in a certain environment? How do you feel visiting a client, right? How do you feel um, going to a super swanky restaurant and how do you feel in a new relationship when maybe you've not experienced true love before or things have been tough before. So recognizing that there is this edge, there is this edge of your comfort zone. And the goal is to start training your nervous system to start moving that edge out just little by little, like what can, what's 10 degrees more uncomfortable for you? And then just hold that and play with that until that becomes comfortable. It's the same thing with the money in your bank account. Become aware of how you feel when you witness um, more or less and just hold that. Sometimes I'll even like hold my body and go, no, no, it's okay. I'm safe. Like I've got this. And then I'll also thank my body. Like when I found out about the skin things and just like how miraculous my body was to try to run this system to help me. Um, I was like, wow, thank you. Like, thank you. Thank you for trying to keep me safe. But this is how this is actually safety. It's like, we have to unlearn the things that we have learned in our childhood and, and through action, insert a new software. 
And that's just really through practice and slowly and every day. And how can you, I I like the example of like the being seen, like I was uncomfortable being seen and that's what was the, the skin condition would, would flare up. And so I started working on being seen as much as I could, as often as I could. So I started wearing really loud clothing. I started um, wearing high heels to the grocery store. Like I started all these different ways, really obnoxiously loud, um, you know, nail polish color. Why? Because I was training my nervous system that it is safe to be seen. And why? Because I knew that I had to work on this specific area so that I could show up better in the business so that we could make more money. And so there is something holding everyone back that is the one thing that they need to work on that's that's limiting their success. And it is stored in the body. It's stored in the emotions. It's stored in the nervous system. And those are the belief systems that when you start pulling them away and you start looking at them and, and observing them and, and updating them, then suddenly the whole future opens up. And so what would it look like if somebody goes too fast? How did one blow out their nervous system? Uh, So if somebody goes too fast, it's like, it's like you've catapulted through that edge and you kind of like, then you come running back to safety, Mm. right? So then you go so far that it actually just becomes a situation that had happened, but you haven't integrated it. And so that can actually work against you because your body will go, yeah, that was scary. Let's never do it again. Right. Okay. You're like, I'm just not a person who does that. No, that's like for other people. That's not for me. Right. So that's like an example of going too far, too fast, too soon. What we really want to do is like work up to it and embody that. And and this shows up. It's actually a really great example is when people, when I first started coaching, there's a lot of coaches who will be like, just double your rates just double your rates. So you're not charging enough. And like, that's the solution to everything, right? Just, just charge more. But I noticed that if I charge beyond my threshold of what I believed was over delivering, then I started getting all weird. I started second guessing myself. I started getting in my own head and I was like, Oh my God. And I started causing all this chaos because I subconsciously didn't believe that I could deliver on that rate. So that is something that I worked up to. And I said, no, no, nervous system. We're going to, we're going to undercharge. We're going to, we're sure I can charge this person, whatever, 10 grand, but I'm going to charge them eight. Why? Because I want to know, I want to know for a fact that, oh, that was like, I am so over delivering. I am so over serving like this. Oh yeah. Then I had absolutely no resistance to the higher price point, because I knew I could way over deliver on that. And so that is a great example of like how really our nervous system and our capacity for wealth and to hold wealth will show up as even in the rates in our business. And so that's a really great area to start working on. And just know that, you know, if you start observing yourself getting really weird (laughs) as I did, Yes. It could be because you're doing too much too soon, too fast. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that makes sense. Like, I know my husband's really been working that way, but he, we're, we're still a different, I'm still like, Oh God, but that's a lot. And it's like, it's also, it's like a big, but the thing is what I've noticed with him is the more he charges, the better quality clients he gets too. Mm -hmm. He gets Mm -hmm. way better clients. Whereas me, I'm just like, Oh, but I don't want to be in like out of, not that I do see clients anymore. Cause I just, I did uh, nutrition stuff, but I just like, Oh, I just, I don't want to work with people anymore. They just, they don't want to do anything. So, but, but still for me, every once in a while I will, but I still have that. Eh, no, that that's a lot. And I feel like I have to, but really I don't have to do anymore because I'm already overdoing for what most people can handle in one session anyways. Right. So it's, mm-hmm. but I get that. I get that. Cause you also have to feel comfortable to, and it doesn't have to happen in these huge stepwise amounts. Right. You can just go smaller steps. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then in, in his, his history and his background and his, you know, association and comfort zone with money is totally different than yours. And so it's interesting when coaches just tell other people to like, just do what they say. And it's like, no, you really have to do what's right for you yeah. because 
one person does not know what's right for you. Only you know what's right for you. And it really does require listening to your own body and observing your own thoughts. Right. Yeah, I get it. And a lot of people aren't very good at that. Like I would say, I I work on that. I've been working on that. And sometimes it's still aren't, I'm not behaving as perhaps I would like to, but I'm watching it, right? I'm aware of it. And First I step is always it, awareness. Right? And I don't have to, I don't have to stay there. Like I was literally mad for three and a half years these past, you know, out of the best, like four and a half, five years. I've been like pissed off for three and a half years. Like, okay, that's mm-hmm. not going to get me anywhere. So mm-hmm. I need to own this and put mm-hmm. that somewhere else. So, yeah. And so let's talk about like that, that we talk a lot about like the feelings and things like that. What about We live in a society of suppression. We suppress our symptoms, our emotions, our feelings, our everything, anything that might look not ideal. We we often put a lid on and stuff. So Mm -hmm. what is that doing to people's capacity to really become their full potential? Right. I I see a lot of people who are, um, who've ignored their bodies so much. There's a disassociation from it. And you can pick it up in people's language. They'll start talking in a third person or they'll start talking in like a generalization. Like, you know, when you do this, when they're really talking about themselves and it's like, oh, you're really disconnected from yourself because otherwise you would be talking and I, I feel this, right? Mm -hmm. Because you feel or people feel, or, you know, that's just what we do. And, you know, they'll, they'll say these things like, like everybody just does these things and, and they're not honoring really their themselves and not speaking from the first person. Um, also a lot of like hyper achievers have had some type of trauma in the past that is driving them to succeed, but it's from an unhealthy place. It's like a drive to prove them to, uh, you know, like, and, and that's why, how they've become so successful, but there's a point where you've got to be able to make that shift and come back into the body before it turns into something that you can't turn back from. Like once the, once you've gone so far, then you're going to have to spend time and energy and money just keeping up on your health because you've pushed your body so hard. And it is, it's, it is a societal norm. And, you know, I, you know, I think it's by design that we don't listen to our feelings that we are in a society where it's all about, um, you know, satisfying impulses and as fast as you possibly can, you know, Amazon same day delivery type thing. Because right. Why? Because it's prolonged satisf- satisfaction or delayed gratification is where we really create our happiness. And the more that we can delay our gratification, the happier we will actually become in the long term. Mm. But People are so used to suppressing a negative emotion, not wanting to feel it. And then that drives them into the behavior of either overspending, overeating, overdrinking, um, overmedicating, or like avoidance patterns. Um, And that's, that's truly because there's not a lot out there like that teaches EQ, that teaches emotional intelligence and understanding that there's usually something here for us that our feelings are communicating something that we need to listen to. Do you, and do, is that something that you help people feel and move through? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's connected to our thoughts because our thoughts are that electrical impulse that first kicks off that feeling. Yeah. And so that is the, the biggest point to get to is, is when you're, whenever you're feeling an emotion, And, or maybe you, maybe you find yourself wanting to get a drink or wanting to escape into Netflix or wanting to, that's a trigger and go, okay, what's going on right now? What am I feeling? What negative emotion am I feeling that I'm wanting to escape? And then you go, what am I thinking about that's causing that feeling? Because it is a trickle down effect. We think it, we feel it. And then there's usually some actions involved that lead us to creating the situation or circumstances where our thought is true. And so it is our thoughts that create the feelings and then just observe how you, how you act when you think that thought, what are the actions that you take? How do you show up? And then what's the result of that? Usually what you'll find is the result is the sum 
of your actions, which is tying back to exactly what you were thinking in the first place. Right. Right. So interesting. It's just, oh, it's so interesting. So you have kids. How old are your kids? 12 yeah. and well, they're both 12 right now. The other one's about to turn 13. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's, this is another area. Like, do you work with this stuff with your children? Like it's, you know, it's like here from mm-hmm. mom all the time. My son's always healing stuff from mom, but like that instant gratification is something kids are growing up with these ways, these days, like we're living in experimental times, right? We have these kids that are growing up with all this unnatural ways of life. And mm-hmm. then they're going to go up into these dissatisfied adults who have no attention span. And, and I'm just wondering with the kids, like, you know, when you had a show that you want to watch when we were kids, it's like, you had to wait a whole week and you had to go through the commercials and you had to, you know, and then it's like cliffhanger and then you had to wait another week again. And now it's like, boom, mm-hmm. boom, boom. Everything's on demand. It's like, yep. you bring principles, like, what do you do with your children yeah. and what are you cho- choosing to do with them? Yeah. So I, I, I like to help them and you can do this too with your kids and everyone listening. I like to help them whenever I'm noticing that there's a meaning being associated to something, you know, she gets a bad grade or she, something happens with her friends or like our, our son Chase at our wedding, he did a speech and he started crying in the middle of the speech. And I became like, Oh, what's going on there? Like, what is whatever he's thinking with a really heightened emotion because there were people watching him. And I was like, oh, I hope like what meaning is he giving this? And so I really encourage him to make a powerful meaning to, wow, man, you stood up in front of all these people and you did this, like, look at how great you are. Look at how powerful you are, you know, like to remind your kids that they have a choice in the meaning that they associate events And whatever meaning they are subscribing to or assigning to an event at school with the teacher, whatever the case may be, that's going to shape and mold how they are and how they show up as an adult. Almost every single one of my clients, we go back to when a teacher said something, or I was playing on the schoolyard and this girl said this. And in those instants, a decision is made. Oh, I'm not good at math. Oh, I shouldn't speak because nobody wants to hear what I have to share or, you know, like these little micro decisions just happen as they go through life. And so the most powerful thing that we can do as parents is encourage our kids to a adopt the frame of everything's happening for you and b assign a powerful meaning to whatever it was. They actually have a choice. They can look at things through a different perspective. Like you know, maybe the teacher was having a really bad day and maybe this was going on maybe that was going on and and ask them, how do they feel when they think about the situation differently? You know, I'm not good at math when the teacher said this versus understanding that the teacher is probably having a bad day or doesn't, you know, whatever the case may be, the, their narrative changes and how they show up because they're feeling different also is different. And I think it's really, important for that to be able to reframe that and to mm-hmm. and even if somebody said something is it yeah. true? because now we're so worried about offending everyone right and we're it's- we're raising these little wilting flowers <laughs> that just get blown in the wind and they just they just it's like oh, we're yeah. teaching to not offend it's like how about we teach the strength to mm-hmm. so that the offense doesn't dictate who we are and, right. and don't depend on the the, you know, the good opinion of others. That's a, yeah. Yeah. And going back to, you know, looking at how long we've been on this planet and knowing that our biology is somehow some way still going to be looking for a threat because we're used to challenges so that when our society is so easy, when kids have it so easy, that's why they're having anxiety. That's why they're having such challenges. And we're seeing all these mental disorders and stuff like that. It's because they're, they're actually not getting that required challenge that required, um, biological challenge that then they can go, Oh, okay. I've got my, you know, like check the box. All right. Body had a challenge. Cool. Got it. Like now I'm, now I can rest. Now I can relax. And, and again, if we think of this as a scale, like a comfort scale, like our comfort scale has gotten like our tolerance for discomfort has 
completely like we've got to grow our tolerance for a little bit of discomfort. Not everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's okay. Why? Yeah. Because it drives you. But we're we're doing a great disservice to this generation, but also they are under psychological attack, really. Like yeah. it they really are. And I was watching um something the other day and, and watching this girl. <laughs> talking about time blindness and how like, well, I just think that, you know, employers should really oh. make amends for people who are time, who can't show up on time. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, the great victimization of our nation. Like wow, that's, that's the thing is when we think we are the victim and we are, I have time blindness. I don't, I don't know what, I can't show up on time. <laughs> it's um, like, it's um. so disempowering. It is. It is. It's mm -hmm. absolutely. And everybody needs to adjust for me, right? right? It's not that I have the power to, you know, and it's not that you need to conform into anything like that, but it's like, everybody has to drop everything and change for you. And, and, and your time blindness is what matters. Like, <laughs> really? Oh, it's just painful. You know, I was just, I've, I actually have read, I'm reading my second, I'm reading novels right now. I haven't done that. I'm always reading information, information, information. Mm -hmm. When I was on holiday, I read Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is a book that I, I, I loved when I was a kid. I'm like, I wonder, like when I was about 20, I'm like, I wonder if I still love this book. And I still really loved it. But I just think of the effort that went into life, right? In the late 1800s or whenever it was, or I think it was then 18 or 1800s. I can't remember, but just the, just the effort and just think, I don't know how many people could survive these days. Right. Or not, right? But and also the, how elaborate their, the architecture was and how elaborate their clothing was. It's like, whoa, talk about a range, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but that makes for strong character, right? You see, yeah. There's that great yep. saying, was it strong men make easy times, easy times make weak men, weak men make hard times, hard times make strong men. Yeah. So here we are going back around to the, <laughs> yeah, we're making some weak men that are going to make for some hard times. I think we're, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and it's by design for sure. And, you know, hopefully we can help our kids mitigate that as much as possible, you know, by teaching them resilience, by designing some struggle, by taking our kids backpacking, by, you know, like enrolling them in sports where they have to have some type of physical exertion and challenge, you know, we can really help them in those ways. Um, yeah, gear up for being better humans for the next what's generation. Been, what's been really amazing for us and our son is he used to be in hockey. And then when this all started, he stopped playing hockey and he started playing disc golf. So disc golf is golf, but with a disc, mm -hmm. but it's going from team sport to like, he does other stuff, but that's one of the things that he's more competitive in and going from team sport to an individual sport. And oh my goodness, that's been amazing for opportunities because you can't blame anyone. You can't count on yeah. anyone but yourself. And so now I'm just like, oh, let's just put a little bit of Joe Dispenza on. I'm like trying to, you know, like that that state and that state of mind is such an amazing, I love it because I love the hard times because they make for such rich conversation and so much mm -hmm. growth out of that. And I'm so thankful because like you said before, we have to be, uh, be willing to go through those failures. Like what if you just, so you just get through it on like everything's easy peasy like what's 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 even the why would you even, like it what's the point of that what do you what do you mm -hmm. get from that where's the growth well, from that? yeah exactly well you know the point of that is they make great employees for what for <laughs> corporations <laughs> that run the world right <laughs> right right so a point for right. other people yeah right uh, so do you have any key tools like maybe let's say people are like we're talking we're talking about mindset perception mm -hmm. What would be like maybe a couple of key tools that you would give for someone who's really struggling and really sees the world from perhaps not the most empowering light? Mm -hmm. You know, what's coming to me now is just to remind people that the world is always abundant and that abundance just changes hands. And when you can observe, when you choose to observe you, and if it's not in your own reality, but when you can observe the abundance that's around you, it for me, it shattered a few belief systems because I did grow up in like the world is scarce, that my worldview was very non-optimistic at all. It was very, very um, scarce and depressing. 
Um, but I started witnessing the, the abundance that other people had abundance around me and not from an envious place, but really curious, like mm-hmm. wildly curious. And I would get curious about the people around me who were more abundant than me. And I would just ask them, what do you think? Like how, so tell me what's going on in your brain right now when you're writing that and like, how, what are your thoughts on this? And I really started getting curious about the people around me. Now, before I did that, I also made a decision and this was a really powerful decision. And this is probably the first thing that I'm going to, yeah, this is the first thing I'm going to recommend for anyone listening as like how to get unstuck, how to overcome where you're at right now. And that is to look at your environment and who you spend time with. Ah, so powerful because these people influence your thinking and you don't necessarily want to ask those people the questions of like, tell me how you're moving through this or something like that. But what really, really was the hyper drive in my life was when I got into a community where people thought differently and I started asking and I started just being this sponge and understanding that there are different realities, that there are, there is a path out. Um, so number one, observe who you spend time around because their thinking is influencing you and just know that you have a choice. You know, a lot of people will be like, well, you know, I have to spend time with my family because they're family, you know, like my aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and stuff like that, mom and dad. It's like, well, you don't necessarily like, where is that written? Like, when did you decide that you have to spend time with people and and what are you getting from that? And is that serving you? So I would become really, really aware of how you spend your time and who you spend your time with. Um, the second one is to get yourself in a different environment. Now this can be your environment of friends or for a lot of people, if you're in like a really small town and there's not a lot of people, what are you listening to? What are you subscribing to? Are you watching the news? Like we talked about earlier, like, right. Are you listening to podcasts like this one where it's really empowering a different way of thinking and in expanding worldview? So look at where you're spending your time, you know, is it on Instagram really take a toll or take a, you know, account for where that, what that is and decide for me, I decided that I wanted to surround myself with people that were more successful than me, uh, in all ways and shapes and forms. I wanted to surround myself with people who were further along in their business that were further, had the relationships that I wanted to call in. Um, that was a big one. And I remember I had one friend and she was just so madly in love. They were so madly in love with each other, her and her boyfriend. Um, and I was like, yes, like mm-hmm. I want to be around that as much as possible. I didn't get jealous. I got curious. And so that's a big that's distinction that. there. That's be that. in the energy, be in the energy of that you wish to become and that which you want as much as you possibly can. You can't help but start to think differently from that place. And then, you know, number three, really take a look at your own mind. And whenever there's a limiting belief, whenever you hear yourself or feel yourself go, oh, that's not for me, or I can't do that, make a log of it. This is your limiting belief log, right? And so just with curiosity, Just know that those are there and that that's just software running in the background and it can be updated. Okay. But first always bring awareness to it and then ask yourself, when did I decide that and do the exercise that we talked about earlier and really dive deep into when did I decide that I couldn't have that thing? When did I decide that I'm not able to do this X, Y, Z and go back and see if there's a subconscious memory that pops up and take a look through a different lens that will usually shift something in the future and just be aware of it. Cause it, you may notice that things are a little different, but that's not all of it. You can have the awareness, you can work on the subconscious program, but then you need to move into the next one. Number four, which is getting into action. You need to be able to get into the action to align yourself to the new you. So it's great to release the past, but then you've got to create and take action and start training your nervous system into the new identity, into who you are now and into the new beliefs 
that you have just made by going back into the past and reassociating something. Okay, great. Now let's get into action. And you're going to want to do that as soon as possible. You're going to want to do that as much as, as frequently as possible. So, you know, like my example about being seen, being seen as much and as, as I possibly can through different tactics and tools and ways. It doesn't always have to be showing up on stage. For me, it was wearing high heels in a grocery store, right? <laughs> like, however, you can start training your system and living into the new identity. And this last one is really about the future you. Having a crystal clear vision for what you want in your life, what you want to experience, what you want to have. And this goes back to the want from having uh -huh. follow the money, say, okay, I want a million dollars. Okay. For what purpose? Okay. So that I could buy the car for what purpose? So that I could get the date for what purpose? So that I could experience love. Okay. Figure out what you're actually chasing. And what this does is this like collapses the timeline, figure out what you're actually chasing, what you're actually after and observe how you can experience that in the now. How can you hold that I have that which I want and grow that sense of gratitude as if it's already happened? And uh, yeah, I mean, those are, that's my best advice for what amazing. to do next. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think that gratitude now, it's that, that's it, cause it just shifts that feeling. And if you're in gratitude, you can't be in lack, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't be in both at the same time. So right. love that, Michelle. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So what, so what do you do? What are you offering to people and how do people connect with yeah. you to find what you're doing? Yeah. Well, go to richereveryday.com. My husband and I, Mike Dillard, we have a group where we help people make more money, but here's the thing. We know that it's not really about money. And so it's called richer every day. But for me, what richer means is it's richer relationships. It's richer, you know, time with your family. It's richer health. It's richer everything. And often the side effect of doing the work that we do in this course is to create more money. You know, we, we position it as a course that helps people make more money and live off of passive income. But the coaching is really all about the stuff that we've talked about, because those are the things, those limiting beliefs are really in people's way of making money in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about that. And then we also share, you know, crypto strategies and how we're investing our money and all the things that we really do help on a educate also people's biological drivers, like the dopamine chase, right? So we do a lot of coaching on the body and its ability or ability to distract you from, uh, from making money. And then the mental, the limiting beliefs and the behaviors and the subconscious patterns. Um, and then on the back end of teaching that in the course, then we share like our strategies and what we're doing. So that's how you can, um, can follow our work at richereveryday.com everyday.com. Okay. And richer in every way, right? That that's yeah. the big thing. Cause I think for a lot of people, there's a lot of rich, rich people out there, but they're not very happy, right? They're not very right. filled. Right. So right. we want the whole, we want it all. So absolutely well, being rich amazing. is really so much more than money. Thanks. So much more, so much more than money. So I don't know. I think, I think that's great. I think, yes. Yeah, or anything else? I think we're, we're, I feel complete. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So I've absolutely loved this conversation. Thank oh. you again so much for having me on. It's, it's been a real treat. Oh, I totally appreciate this, Michelle. Just hold on one sec, but thank you. Okay, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I, this is important stuff because this is all within us. You don't have to, you don't have to take anything, you know, it's all within each and every one of us. If we so choose, then we can, we can really put these tools to practice and really change the effect the impact, the results of our life. But then we change the lives around us and we can start impacting other people too. And it's, it's just, I think it's an important avenue uh, to go down. So thank you, Michelle. Okay, guys, please yeah. share if you enjoyed this and see you again on the next one.